Okay, so my name is Halsey Derrick, and I'm here with my grandmother, Linda Marshall, and it is like 3-ish p.m. I just got out of my junior year of high school. Well, I'm still in it, but only for like one more month, and I'm going to interview her. So it's for a project, but hopefully I can pass this video down to my children and grandchildren so they can know the foundation of this family. And... So, Grandma, why don't you introduce yourself? Okay, I'm Linda Marshall. And I've, I've lived, I was raised in California, Southern California, but at the age of 20, we moved up here to Prosser, Washington. And um, I've, I have loved it ever since. I would never leave this place and go back to California or any other big city. I'm just, I, I love this community. Um, I worked at the post office for 25 years, well, actually 35. 25 years in, in, inside at the window and then 10 years delivering mail. And then uh, now I live on a little five acre farm with horses and dogs. I raise dogs and I did raise horses for many, many, many years. Uh, I had like 30 brood mares and a couple of stallions and I raised the horses, paint horses registered. And um, I loved it. But when I retired, I sold down the herd and, and took a little time off. And now I have, uh, my daughters are all grown up with kids and so I'm now a grandma and I got some great grandkids and uh, I'm just living the life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I have 15 questions in particular that I wanna ask you, mm -hmm. but um, if you ever don't remember something, you can tell me and I'll just move on to the next question because I have a whole bunch more questions if that case happens or if you're not comfortable talking about something or it's just not very interesting, like, don't be afraid to let me know and we'll just move on, okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the first one is, do you remember the day that Kennedy was killed? I definitely remember that day. I was um, at school and uh, and it somebody came in the room and announced it to the whole classroom. Mm -hmm. And it, we were all crying. It was just so dramatic because everybody loved that man. Um, my mother saved, uh, a, she has a whole suitcase full of all the newspapers that came out about that. Mm. And um, uh, it was just the biggest thing that had ever kind of like happened in our lives. It was so dramatic. You know, we just cried like babies. <laughs> Wow. Mm -hmm. Oh, and just for reference, it is May 13th, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. 2022. So our president is Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Um, what do you remember? Well, do you remember the day that MLK Jr. was killed? Um, I do. Um, I don't remember it as well as I remembered Kennedy and, and a few of the other big events in my life. But I do remember it a, a, a lot. It was a, it was huge too. It was like almost as big as Kennedy, but mm -hmm. um, but and I know it was very very difficult time, very difficult time, and um, for the uh, the other the race mm -hmm. and uh, but it was yeah. I just remember it being very very difficult time. And there was a lot of crying, a lot of hardship, and a lot of problems when that happened. Okay. Um, and when the civil rights movements was happening, so you were born in 1947, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So more, this is more touching on the late 50s and 60s, because I feel like you'd remember that more, because mm -hmm. in 1950, you would have turned 13. Three. In 1950, I've been three years old. Oh my goodness. Okay, so in 1960, you would have turned 13. Okay, so let's just focus on the 60s. Because okay. I feel like that's when you're old enough to really like make your own opinion and remember. So um, what was your reaction to the civil rights movement as it was happening in the 60s? Um, it was just a, a another real big thing going on. Um, <clears throat> I don't really know what to say about that one. Okay. Move on. Um, and do you remember watching MLK Jr.'s speeches or anything like that? Uh, or? Oh, yes, I do. Okay. Uh, yeah. He was on TV a lot. 
Um, only back then we just had a little tiny screen TV <laughs> and it was in like a console. <laughs> uh -huh. But we watched him all the time on TV and um, it, he was a he was such a, a huge man in the world that it, it was hard on us to know when he got shot. It was just terrible. Mm. Um, uh, and after it happened, we even got to know more about him because they deep they went in deeper in his life mm -hmm. and and his friends and his family and everything. So it, it was just a huge thing that happened. And and every single year when it comes on his birthday, it's it all comes back to you. Every bit of it all comes back. If if Kennedy or any of them are on TV for anything, everything just comes back to you because it was so huge in your life. Mm -hmm. So. so was your family's reaction at the time, like when Martin Luther King Jr. started gaining traction, was it like um, a surprised reaction or like a supportive reaction or? It was a supportive reaction. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I mean, obviously so. times were very, very different at the time. Yeah, they, they were. There was um, a lot of uh, fighting going on. There was a lot of... Uh, problems with this whole thing, you know, but we, we all loved him. We thought he was a, a great man. He was a great man, you know, protecting his race. We would have done the same thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's great because even in the 1960s, mm. there was a lot of racism. Yes. Um, what do you remember about the day the Challenger exploded in the 80s? That was almost speechless for me because they had it all on TV. When the, you know, they were just showing it as it went up and went up and went up. And then all of a sudden it just exploded. And, and nobody could, nobody could talk or say a word. They were just like, oh my God, these, you know, it's, it was just uh, so, so sad to watch that happen. I mean, it was just right, it ha it, we watched it as it happened. And it was just shocking as it could be. Yes. Yeah. Um... Describe your memory. <laughs> describe your memory of the day America landed on the moon. Um, my memory was yay because <laughs> we did it, you know. Yeah. And I, um, you know, it was one of those things where so many, so many life changes were going on when when I was growing up, and even as an adult. It was just another one of the things that were just unexplainable to you. I mean, I you watched, you watched the whole thing on TV. You watched him walk out on the moon for the first time, and um, it it was just amazing that they did it. But I I knew they would. I knew they could. <laughs> I knew it. And it was all that knowing that made it when it happened. I just, you know, I just yes, that's us. That's the USA. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and also, I know this is an interview for my grandma, but I'm 16 years old, and every time I go to my grandma's house, she always has food or snacks for me, and today she's making her famous oatmeal cookies, <laughs> and I hope to be that kind of grandparent to my future family, but anyways, um, what did you think when you first heard about the Watergate scandal in the 70s? Um, that's when I really skip. Okay. What was your reaction to the... Oh, I asked you that already. Um, what was your opinion on the Vietnam War as it was happening in the 60s and 70s? My opinion of that was mm -hmm. we should never have been there. Mm -hmm. it, it killed so many of our guys. We should never have been there. Mm -hmm. And um, So I was really against the war. Yeah. I thought that we just... It should never have happened. Every time we get a report on how many of our men were killed that day, it just sickened me yeah. that, that this was being allowed to happen. It's just, it was just not a, a war to ever remember or be proud of. It was never to be proud of. Yeah. And I felt very, very sorry for the men that came home. A lot of them were treated badly. Mm -hmm. And I could never understand that and, until I, I, I mean, could never understand why they were treated badly. I mean, they were our servicemen and they were fighting for our country. There was a lot of rumors about things that they did over there. A lot of that was just not true. 
And uh, I had family members that went over there and came back. And they actually told me what, what happened in a lot of incidences and why the Americans were so angry with them to do what they did. Mm -hmm. But they still weren't doing what everybody said they were doing. Mm -hmm. It was just all a bad situation. Yeah. Oh. Um, did you have any family members or friends die? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Really? I did. Yes. So that opinion on the Vietnam War, did that change over time or was it the same throughout? It's the same throughout. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So tell me what my mom was like when she was a kid. Your mom was, um, she was the sweetest child that a parent could ever want. She, she never, ever, she hardly ever cried. If I'd ask her to do something, she'd do it. There was no um, threatening or spankings or nothing. She just did it. it. She was a dream child. And uh, when she was like three and a half years old, I had my second daughter. And things were different. <laughs> she was a wonderful child, but she was very, very bashful. Very, very bashful. She wouldn't let anybody look at her. She didn't want nobody to even touch her. She just wanted me. And, and, if she, and if she woke up in her bed and I wasn't right there, she'd just start screaming. She, was, she cried some. <laughs> and uh, it was a, lot, a big difference. But, but lit, your mom, was. she went to bed when I asked her to. She jumped in the bathtub when I asked her to. I mean, I, I, she was a dream child. And then I thought, well, I might as well have another one. The kids are so easy. And then it was a little more difficult, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> but I wouldn't have traded it for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell me about your wedding day with uh, Grandpa Chuck. Well, my wedding day was in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, my mom and my dad were there. Mm -hmm. And it was just my mom and my dad, his brother, Harold, and his wife, Paula, and um, and then Chuck and I. And when we got there, we found a, a wedding chapel that fit us. It was called the Hitching Post. <laughs> <laughs> so that was where we got married. And um, and it, was, it, it wasn't the big wedding that a lot of people like, but it was us. And it was in Las Vegas, and it was just... A great memory. Yeah. <laughs> it was a good memory. Yeah. Um, how have you raised your kids differently than the way your parents raised you? Not, not actually very different at all. Uh, they were, they were strict on us kids. We, they didn't count to three. They told us once we heard them. That's, and we did it. Because you didn't talk back, especially back in those days. None of the kids talked back to parents. Mm -hmm. And we certainly did not because we didn't want to get in trouble. And we would get in trouble. It wasn't a matter of, oh, she won't get in there. Well, yeah, she don't talk back. Don't do what, do what she says because you're in trouble if you don't. So we always did. And that's kind of like how I did your, your mom and, and your Aunt Lori. I was very strict on them. They weren't allowed to fight or hit each other they it just wasn't going to be in my home and again I didn't count to three ever I told them once they heard me that's all it takes I, I don't have to count to three to any kid you know mm -hmm. um I wasn't I wasn't mean to them at all I loved them to death so between love and discipline they grew up to be very sensible down-to-earth people that that they have such good sense and such good morals. And I think it was because of the way they were raised. It was like, we love you dearly. Don't do wrong because you'll be punished. But but, uh, but we love you. And we did. We loved them. We took them everywhere with us. We went on big vacations every year. And they were right there by our side. And most, most of the vacation would be for what they wanted to do too. And it was a big deal for the whole family. We got it, moved out in the country and got them horses. We just had a lot of fun growing up. I miss those years so bad because mm -hmm. they were the funnest years of my life is when my kids were home with me. 
when they were little and when even they grew up and to be teenagers. We had so much fun together. Mm -hmm. And um, it was the, the best part of my life. So. Okay. Um, tell me about when you met uh, Chuck. Well, um, I've been a kind of a cowgirl my whole life. Mm -hmm. And I had a horse um, that when I was, I think I got him when I was about 13. And I raised him up and I broke him and, and I would ride him every night after school. And where I was riding down in Southern California, there, there was this, this huge area that I lived on this side of the big highway. And one day I decided to ride on the other side of the highway just to see uh, what was over there. And uh, so I did. I went to the other side of the highway and just rode around. And I saw this great big huge arena. And uh, so I just, that attracted me. I had to go over there and see it. And there was this cowboy in there riding this Palomino horse. And and I just sat there and I watched him for the longest time. And he, and he was so handsome. <laughs> and he um, it was on this big beautiful horse. And I was just memorized by him. And so he finally rode over to me and we talked and talked and talked that's how we kind of got introduced we introduced each other and then from there it just kind of went mm -hmm. um okay. tell me what you remember about your grandparents i don't want to do that one okay i don't like my grandparents oh you didn't mm -mm. Oh, okay um so, did your dad ever talk to you about him coming to America from Norway? Um, he never really talked a lot about it, but um, I just know that they all did come over from Norway. And, uh, and the one thing that was really funny about it is that uh, in his, like his uh, papers from when he was a child or birth certificates and stuff like that their last name was Larson his name was Vernon Larson and he and it was spelled L-A-R-S-O-N but somewhere along the road and they don't even know their self when or why but it was changed to L-A-R-S-E-N so we've all gone by Larson for our whole lives it was Larson and then uh, some of the papers that we found it, we saw that it was spelled Larson and um we just were very, very confused about that. So finally, just looking into any papers that we had from our past, um, it was just, they didn't know how it happened. It just, it's it's crazy that it, that could happen, but it did. So now I still go by Linda Larson Marshall uh, because it's our L-A-R-S-E-N. It was just a funny thing that happened. <laughs> Do you know anything else about like your whole, um, like? that whole family like his siblings and all of them coming from Norway or is that just about all you know the only other thing I know is that when they got over here to America and they kind of grew up they were ch children they moved over here and then when they grew up and he had two sisters and him and his mom and dad and when uh, um, when he was like 17 years old his dad got tuberculosis and back in the 40s back then, he, or no, it was back in the uh, 30s, tuberculosis was very common. A lot of people got it. And if you got tuberculosis and you were diagnosed with it, you, you, you were not allowed to walk the streets and give it to other people. You had to go to a, a, a hospital and you could not leave until you were healed from it, which a lot of people didn't get healed. His father got tuberculosis and he didn't go to the doctor. He stayed home until he died. And then his mother got tuberculosis and she stayed there until she died. They wouldn't go to a doctor. A lot of people didn't because they knew they were gonna have to go to a hospital and they wanted to just stay home. Um, then both of his sisters came down with tuberculosis and both of them died. So his whole family died. And then he came down with it and he went directly to the hospital. And he stayed in that hospital for like two years and it saved his life. A lot of people just couldn't live through it, but it, he did. 
So then when he got over it, then he got to come out and then he didn't have any family. So um, I'm not exactly sure who he went and lived with. I should have asked him some of those questions, but he, he got over it and got jobs and moved on to California and that's where he met my mom. In, the, in Long Beach, California, and then they got married and had four kids. <laughs> mm-hmm. All this. Um, so, Nana, your mom, do you know uh, her origins or, like, her family's origins? Do you know where they came from or My anything mom's like that? mom? Yeah, so, like, your mom was born in the U.S., right? Uh-huh, yeah. So do you know where her family's from? I don't. I've never, I don't know where they came from. Okay. Um, just any... Okay, never mind. Um, do you know anything about Grandpa Chuck's family origins? They, um, they were always down in, uh, lived in Missouri and in Arkansas and Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. They were all down there. There's a whole lot of the Marshall family down there. And then his, his mom and dad had nine kids. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, I'm not sure what year they all moved to um, California, but they all loaded up all of them kids and, the, <laughs> and whatever they owned that they could fit in the back of the car or whatever, and they drove all the way out to California. It, it was amazing. <laughs> anyway, they started a life in California then, and, and who could work worked, and who couldn't, you know, would stay home and... When I met him, his family was all in Ontario, California, and some of them were, um, they had moved, were married, now they were older and they were married, but they were all still yet living around their mom and dad, and um, uh, Chuck had been married just before, before I met him, and he had a daughter named Jean, and then those two, they split up and got divorced. And then he married me. And then I had the my two girls. Okay. So do you know, um, Grandpa Chuck's like, do you know where his mom and dad came from? Or not really? Not really. Okay. Mm-mm. Okay, we've only been interviewing for 22 minutes. So I have time for my other questions. <laughs> okay. Um, Am I not getting into enough detail? No, you're good. Okay. I just like had 15 um, for sure ones, and the other ones are like, oh, if we have time, we'll get to them. Ah, oh, good, okay. okay. Uh, describe the first car you ever had. Oh, my gosh. The first car I ever had was, I got it when I, after I graduated from high school. Um, uh, it was a 1962 Chevy Supersport. It was to die for. It was so beautiful. <laughs> and, uh, um, back in the 60s, the cars were hot. Everybody had to have a hot car. Mm-hmm. And they did. They had all the 1957 Chevys and the 1958 Chevys and 59 Chevys with the big fins. They had everything. I had a 62 Chevy, and I loved it. And um, <clears throat> there was a time when back in that in that era, the kids would raise the front end up. Later on in the later years, they raised the back end up, but in those years, it was the front end, and mm-hmm. you just put spacers between the springs and lift it up, and so, of course, I had that done, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, but my dad, when my dad came home from work and saw the car, he just came in there and said, get those off of that car, <laughs> you're going to ruin it, you know, mm-hmm. so I had to take them off, but it still looked good. It was a great car, really, really great car anyway, and that was my first car. I always have wanted to get me another car just like it. Same color, same everything, but I have never seen one. So, mm. but that was my number one car. So why do you think it was that at the time, like everyone had these super nice cars? Like were they af- more affordable like at the time? Like people could buy new cars and be okay? Or uh, was it because like, I remember my history teacher telling me something, I don't remember exactly, but, um there became a point in time where it was okay it was after world war ii so like in the 50s um people had enough money that they could like each family could have two cars not all the time but like it became more common to be like a two-car family when before it was there was one car in a family yeah Yeah. um and your question was what again 
Um, <laughs> why do you think it was, was it like because of that reason that everyone had nicer cars? I think so. I okay. think so because it wasn't like there was a money situation that people couldn't drive really, really nice cars. Even the kids, they had nice cars for their kids. Or the kids had a little job on the side that they could afford to pay for their gas and their insurance and their upkeep. Um, but uh, it, it was a good, it was a real good time. A lot of good years in there for the American people. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't know the exact like statistics of everything, but I feel like now... Um, even my friends, for example, like Caleb, Zach, and Trevor, they all work as much as they can. Like, they work mm -hmm. like crazy. Well, like Trevor and Zach do. And they can afford, like, cars, but not super nice cars. Yeah. But, but they also have to pay for their gas and their insurance and the upkeep and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Just different times, I guess. Different times, yes, it is. Tell me about a time you got in trouble when you were young. Well, um, it was when I was like 16, and my we had we only had one car in the family. That's all we had. Everybody had to use that one car, and and something went wrong with the car. It broke down. I'm not sure what exactly it was, but my dad had been working every single day on that car. He was under it. He was over it. He was doing everything he could to repair it himself because we didn't have the money to. At that time, there wasn't a lot of money to spare for mechanics and all this. You fixed it yourself, and he did. When he got it all done, <clears throat> I wanted to borrow the car and, and uh, pick up my girlfriend. And I told told mom and dad, I said, you know, I need to buy a new pair of shoes. So can I borrow the car to go to the store and get me some shoes? Dad said, yeah, yeah, here, here's the keys. And then when you get back, you can tell me how it runs because I got it all fixed today. So you can tell me how it runs. And I said... All right, all right. So um, I left then, and I stopped and got my girlfriend so we could go cruising for a little bit. <laughs> and uh, ran into a shoe shop, got me a pair of shoes real quick so we could spend more time cruising. <laughs> and then when we were on our way home, this is down in Ontario, California, they have railroad tracks going through town, and they had them going, the, the, the road would go up like this, and on the top was the railroad tracks, and then it would go back down there like that. And we were <clears throat> heading home, and we were about a block away from the railroad tracks, and my girlfriend said, hey, Linda, get going as fast as you can and see how we can fly over them railroad tracks. I said, okay. So I just stepped on it, and we just took off, and I'm just really going fast. We went up over the top of that thing, and we went straight through the air like Dukes of Hazard. <laughs> <laughs> and we went all the way to the bottom, and we hit the ground, bam, Oh, it was like we crashed down below and her and I hit heads and it was just like horrible, you know. And so the car kept running. So I just kept heading on home and we're going, oh my goodness, I'll never do that again. <laughs> and then, uh, the, you know, the red oil light came on, but it ran fine. I didn't worry about that. So I just kept on going home. <laughs> and so... When I got home, <clears throat> my dad said, so how did the car run? And I said, oh, it ran real good, dad, ran real good. I, I did notice on the way home the oil light came on, but there was no problem, it ran just fine. And he goes, the oil light? And I said, yeah, okay. So he grabbed the flashlight and he went outside and I just thought, oh no, I'm dead now. <laughs> so he went out there and looked. I had wiped out the whole oil pan. Grandma, I did that when I crashed my car when no. I was 16. The, really? I smashed the oil pan. <laughs> oh, no. That's so funny. <laughs> I did, and that's exactly what I did. <laughs> only, only my, you didn't do yours on purpose. I did. <laughs> I mean, I went flying over that thing. He came in the house. He was so mad. But he just... What happened? <laughs> he was just, and I felt bad <clears throat> about that all the time because of the fact that he worked on it so hard. Yeah. And then I went out and messed it all up. And I just, I felt bad about that my whole life that I did such a thing. But that's when I got in trouble the worst. <laughs> what did you tell him happened? Or did you just tell him the truth? No. <laughs> <laughs> I told him that. I kind of went off the road a little bit and hit some uh, over the, going over the railroad tracks, and I hit the 
I had the rail the railroad uh, beams things. Oh, okay. So he probably knew better than that because the whole bottom of the car had to be smashed. Yeah. You know, not just the oil pan, but the yeah. oil pan was gone. <laughs> yeah. When I crashed my car, the whole bottom was just smashed. Like my transmission smashed. Oh. How do you need a transmission? My oil pan absolutely smashed. Oh. There's a couple other things. Anyways, what were you going to say? Nothing. Just oh, okay. That, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nothing. It was amazing that uh, I, I just, I never forgiven myself for doing that to him. I mean, you're also just a... I was a 16-year-old kid that didn't know yeah. that that could happen when I went flying over the railroad tracks. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think you thought that you were going to catch air like No, that. I didn't. I just thought I might go a little bit over and then go down. But, man, I was going, boom, like that. <laughs> <I> just... <laughs> it was crazy. Oh. Um, how is school in your day different than the school I go to? The school I went to down in California was an enormous school. It was huge. It was over, you know, 3,500 kids in that school. And it was, um, it, there was a lot of racism, racism in that school. There was the, the blacks and the, and the Spanish and the white kids. And there was a lot of fighting and problems all the time. I didn't like school because of all the problems there was with it. I didn't I didn't want to go to the games and it, there was problems at games. There it, you know there was um it just wasn't a fun place to be. So once I got out of school, I didn't you know, I just I was thankful I got was out of there. I just couldn't I just graduated, but I couldn't I couldn't wait to graduate because I didn't enjoy it at all. And then when we moved up here and ever since we've been here, I've seen a lot of my grandkids and my, my two daughters go to school here and their kids. And I wish so bad that I'd have been here and graduated from Prosser. Yeah. It would have been so much fun to, to be in Prosser and graduate at, at Prosser High School. It was, it, it's a completely different atmosphere, completely different everything. It's a much better school, much funner. And, and I would have learned a lot more. I would have been, I would have liked school. I didn't care for school at all because it was just a mess down there. Yeah. So I wish I'd have been here to graduate. And I know all the people around here, and it feels like I should be in their class picture. Yeah. Because <laughs> I know them all. Yeah. You know, I should have been here. So, but at least I got here. That's the thing. At least I got here. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I think I already know the answer to this question, but I still want to interview you about it. What did people your age do for fun when they were young? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Down there in California, when I got my driver's license, um, all the way up to when I was like 20, it was like, uh, first thing you did was everybody cruised. Now they don't do that. They, they, they just don't. Even in the bigger cities, I, I don't think that they cruise. I don't know that they do. I don't think so. I don't think so either. And they, But back then, it was bumper to bumper to bumper. There was miles of kids that would cruise. And you would cruise through this one big town, and, and you would go as slow as you possibly could without getting, you know. But there was bumper to bumper. I mean, you couldn't go fast. And then you would go clear up to the next town and go up to this huge drive-in, what was a hamburger joint. And you'd cruise around that, and then you'd go on back down and cruise down Holt Boulevard all the way through the Cremona and Cal uh, Ontario. And then you'd turn around and cruise back. Or you'd stop at the A&W, and at all the cars would be like in a big circle. And all the kids would be out there talking. And, and uh, it was just so much fun. So much fun. And then the other thing we did was we lived 30 miles from the beach. So everybody I knew and myself, we'd go to the beach all summer long and uh, uh, build a bonfire out there at night, you know, and just, we were on the beach all the time. And um, I learned a little bit of surfing. Um, I, I was just a real beach bum. And I and it was the best years of growing up. I Lindy and Lori didn't get the opportunity to do a lot of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I always wish they had it because it was so much fun. And I didn't get in trouble. I had a lot of fun, but I didn't get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And I wish that they could have 
experienced some of that. It was just unbelievable. Yeah. So it was a good, it was a really good period in Southern California to grow up <laughs> as a teenager. Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like now my friends and I, like, we drive around and go do stuff like that. It's not really cruising because it's not like you don't really see anyone else. Mm -hmm. But, like, we all pile into a car and just drive around the country and, I don't know, go cause trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And listen to music and yep. get food. Which is, like, similar but different. Yeah. As long as you're with your friends and you're having a good time. Yeah. I remember one time we we would we were also were only about 30 miles from Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And so we would go cruise Hollywood Boulevard and Sunset Strip. And on those two main roads through Hollywood, they had like a walkway in between. There would be two roads going this way and two roads that way. And in between was a walkway. And there would be all kinds of people standing there watching the cars go by because it was bumper to bumper cruising and so they would for a mile there would be nothing but people 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 watching you know and hollering and and um you know some of them were kind of different <laughs> so we would there'd be a pile of girls in my car and we'd be going up there and we'd be going oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know we just <laughs> we had so much fun <laughs> it was just fun 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 <laughs> um did you keep in contact with any of them? Yes, I do. I have some really good friends that uh, I went to school with back then, and now they they don't live here, but they live in the east western part of the United States, and, and I do keep in contact with them a lot. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, describe your hometown when you were a teenager. I mean, I think you did a little bit, but can you go into any um, further detail or no? Uh, it was, well, when we were born as four kids, we lived in Benicia, California, and then we moved from there, and we went, and we moved to Mount Bullion, and that's a, a little mountain town in uh, central California near Yosemite National Park, mm. and, um, that was the, I, I don't even know how to explain why that town was so important to us but we loved being there it was uh, all of us all four of us kids mom and dad loved being there it was just so homey and so country and and uh, up in the pine trees and it was um it just broke our hearts when we had to leave and then we went down to, to ontario down to southern california where the population was enormous the the population of mount bullion was 175 Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we just loved it. And then when we went down to Ontario, well, that was the big, big city. And we were just sick about it for a long time. But finally, we got used to it. And then we started turning into teenagers. And then that was kind of fun. So, mm -hmm. um, but Ontario was, uh, it was big city living. So, um I always, we always loved Mount Bullion a whole lot more, but we, Ontario was good too. We, we enjoyed it, especially when we got older. Mm. So, um, and sorry, then when I took mom, my shoes off, so I hope my feet don't <laughs> stay too stink. bad. Good. And then when, uh, my, and then we moved up here to Washington when I got married and, um, mom and dad, when they retired, they moved up here and they lived right here and right outside of Prosser. Mm-hmm. And so that was wonderful when they did that. I loved it. I was so happy they moved out here. Yeah. So. Um. Oh, I remembered. So when I when you were talking about when you got in trouble, it was you were you left to like go get shoes. Uh huh. Do you remember what shoes you bought? Because like right now the style, like one of the styles that's popular right now, like the shoes that I wear are Converse. So like, what was the main styles when you were a teen? Uh, tennis shoes. Just like normal tennis yeah, shoes? Yeah, just normal tennis shoes. Okay. Mm -hmm. They didn't have Nikes and all that. Yeah. They just had the regular plain tennis shoes. Mm. Yeah, I think Nike came around like 70s. Yeah, I think so too, yeah. Um. What was better or worse about life in America when you were growing up as compared to now? Hmm. 
Well, right now, back years ago, it was a better place. There was people weren't driving by shooting each other, mm -hmm. and there wasn't so many drugs out there that, you know, I have friends that have kids that have gotten a hold of bad drugs and they're dying, mm -hmm. and um, uh, it, it just was a much nicer place to live. Um, you there was of course down down in the big city, like I said when I graduated from high school down there. The school was kind of a dangerous place to be because there was so much fighting going on there. But that mainly was in in high school where there was a lot of kids going through a lot of moods, bad moods. And um, what do they call that? Uh, puberty. Hormones. Puberty and hormones and... Um, teen angst. Huh? I said teen angst. Yeah, it's just kids, they go through a lot. And I, I know I was a kid too. And when you get older, you don't you don't worry about so much stuff as you did then. It's not such a big deal about stuff. But that, I, I blame that on the, the years of being a teenager. And all the other ones were teenagers, and they all had a lot of problems. So, um, but not counting that, it was just a, an easier, easier life. Now you have to worry about driving down the road and somebody pulling them next to you and shooting you. It's, it's... Um, there's a lot of crime every single day in these quiet little towns. There never used to be. And that bothers me a lot. Yeah. It bothers me a lot. It makes me kind of want to move up into the mountain somewhere where there's not a whole lot of people. But that'll probably never happen. But sometimes you want to do that just to get away from this craziness here, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So you would like to tell my future grandchildren not to do drugs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I could preach to them. I, I preached to your mom and Aunt Lindy, or Lori, about drugs. I preached and I preached and I preached to them, and, and they never did. They never, ever did anything like yeah. it. Never had. I didn't. When they, and, and when I was a teenager, drugs were just really coming in. But I didn't want them. I, I, don't, I don't need that, you know, to be happy. Yeah. And uh, then I, pre I preached to those girls constantly about it, and they never, ever... Never tried nothing. Yeah. And that was wonderful for me. <laughs> That's their mother to, and wonderful for them that they didn't. Um, it probably wasn't a bad idea either to move out of the city when mm -hmm. you did. Because I know starting in the 70s, there was a lot of, not nearly as much as now, but there was drug problems in the cities. Mm-hmm. The bigger cities? Yeah. Yeah. I was so happy to get up here and raise my two little girls in this wonderful area. I, I, I was the best thing I ever did was to bring them here and not get them away from all that down there. So it is good. Um, would you ever go, like, have you ever, or would you ever go back and visit Mount Bullion? Oh, yeah. In fact, I did, we did that about... Um, it's just been a few years ago. We, it, us four kids, decided to have a, a family. The uh, um, uh, <laughs> union. Uh, what do you call reunion? It? Reunion. <laughs> and um, we went to Mount Boyan, and we that was the best trip the four of us had ever taken. Of course, Mount Boyan doesn't have a motel, but so Mariposa is a, a town five miles away from Mount Boyan. Mariposa is a town, and they have hotels and motels and all that, restaurants and stuff. So we got uh, uh, rooms in, in Mariposa, and then from there we would go to Mount Bullion, and, and um, there was a little bar in Mount Bullion, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> it was the only thing in Mount Bullion that there was, was the bar. But they also served uh, sandwiches, hamburgers, and stuff like that, and you could buy like a little store. It was like milk and bread and stuff like that. You could buy stuff like that. But it was the only place. So everybody would meet in Mount Bullion every night. And they'd all visit and all that. It was just a real meeting place. It was a great meeting place. And uh, uh, <clears throat> what was I going, going with that? Um, shoot. I was going somewhere with it and I can't remember what it was. Um, what was the question? Um, 
Oh, I asked you if you would ever go back to visit. Oh, okay. Or something like that with yeah. Malfoy. <clears throat> and uh, that was one of the best trips we ever took as a, as a four family, this, the four of us. It was, being there was just unbelievable. The house we lived in was torn down, so it wasn't there anymore. Mm. But it was right on the corner of Highway 49.